Grab your Bibles and go to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Praise the Lord. John chapter 21. And uh, I also want you to know that uh, at the end of the service today, we're going to give you a special update regarding our search for a worship pastor. How many know that we've been searching for a worship pastor, right? So we have a really special update for you at the end of the service today. All right, John chapter 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Everybody say fishing. <laughs> they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out immediately, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So this morning, I want to begin a short series, going to go through the next couple of weeks leading up to Pentecost Sunday. It's simply called From the Empty Tomb to the Upper Room. And uh, last week, as you know, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, so today, what I want to do is begin a journey from the empty tomb, and we want to follow the disciples as they journeyed for the next few weeks, uh, ultimately arriving to the upper room in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we're going we're gonna to bring our journey uh, to an end there in the upper room. We're going to talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the power of God available to your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, um, so we begin here in John 21. Uh, it's not even a week after the resurrection. And the disciples, they have this amazing encounter with Jesus rising from the dead. We read that yes, uh, last week. Uh, you see it in all of the Gospels. Jesus rose from the dead, appeared to the, wom the women at the tomb, appeared to the disciples behind closed doors. I mean, they saw Jesus. They encountered the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, can you imagine? What an amazing thing to encounter someone who died and then rose from the dead. But here's Peter. After encountering the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he says, I'm going fishing. Hardly the response you'd expect from someone who experienced their risen Lord. So the first thing that I want to cover as we journey from the empty tomb to the upper room is overcoming discouragement. Discouragement. I am going fishing. What is that about? Peter was discouraged. He was giving up. He was going back to his old life as a fisherman. I'm going fishing. It's interesting, the Greek, the Greek word there for the word going is the word hupago. And it means literally to, to go away, to, to depart. And generally that word is used to indicate permanence. It's the sense of leaving and, and, uh, and not returning. It's like when Jesus, he used that word when he would tell demons to go to go out from a person who was possessed. In other words, get out and don't come back. And Peter used that word to indicate that he was, he was leaving, that he was, he was going back to his old life. Now you might say, well, why was Peter so discouraged? Well, remember, Peter had denied Christ three times before Jesus went to that cross. And Jesus, you'll remember the story there, Jesus, he told all of his disciples at the Passover supper, he said, all of you are going to forsake me. And Peter said, not me, Lord. He said, now all these others, they may, but I will never forsake you. I will follow you to the death. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, by the time you hear the rooster crow twice, you will have denied me three times. And then Luke chapter 22 records what happened in verse 60, Peter when confronted with knowing Jesus, said, I don't know the man. And while he spoke, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. In that moment, the rooster crowed, the Lord turns, makes eye contact with Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And then verse 62 says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter's discouragement here was rooted in his own self-condemnation. 
He was swallowed up in the shame of feeling like, like a failure, and he was stuck there. He was stuck at that point of failure, and he was unable to recover from it. And not just Peter. In Matthew 25, or 26, verse 56, it says that all of the disciples forsook Jesus and fled. They were all feeling that discouragement and that disappointment in themselves, which brings us to the first truth about discouragement, that discouragement is universal. All of the disciples felt this discouragement, just as everyone at some point will face discouragement in their life. If it happened to Peter and the disciples, it'll happen to you and me. Have you ever felt discouraged? Sure. Well, what is discouragement? Discouragement is simply the loss of courage. It's the loss of confidence. It's the the loss of the ability to have hope. And hope is the expectation of good. So you lose this ability of hope and you lose confidence and you lose the courage to go on and to stay engaged. The dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, defines discouragement as the inability to rise above the sadness from the disappointments we all face. And that leads to more disappointment and ultimately to disillusionment and despair. But here's the thing that I really want us to know about discouragement, that discouragement is a choice. It's a choice. Because discouragement is really a feeling. It's an emotion that develops within us. Discouragement is not something that someone does to you. Now, I know that we might say to someone, well, you've really discouraged me, right? But discouragement ultimately is it's a feeling. It's how you allow yourself to react, that you allow yourself to lose hope, you allow yourself to lose confidence, and you're unable to rise above whatever disappointment it is that you've, that you've faced, right? And we all get disappointed. All of us, right? Some of you were disappointed today. Maybe you came up, you didn't find your favorite parking spot, or you didn't find your favorite seat. You came in, right? Expecting to have your seat. Somebody sitting in your, your seat, you're a little disappointed. Maybe somebody didn't say hello to you, you know, and so you're disappointed, right? Or maybe it happened at home before you even left the house. Maybe, you know, your wife said something to insult you, or maybe your husband ignored you, right? Didn't compliment your, your dress or your awesome Hudson Valley Leadership Summit. Nobody said anything about that, right? Or maybe it happened at work. You didn't get the promotion that you wanted, or you didn't get the raise that you wanted. We all get disappointed. Things happen or don't happen that we want, right? But how we react to disappointment is a choice. No one determines how you react to the disappointments that you're going, you're going to face. And you can choose to say, well, God is in control of my life. God is in control of my circumstance, right? And I believe that God is working all things out together for the good, even though I didn't get the raise, I didn't get the promotion, I didn't get the parking spot, right? Whatever it is, God is in control of my life, and I choose to have this outlook rather to sink into discouragement and lose my faith and lose my hope, my ability to expect good or to think good about someone or some situation or remain optimistic. Discouragement is a choice. Everybody say a choice. This is why in 1 Samuel chapter 30, when David was at Ziklag, the scripture says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Right? They came back from battle to their camp at Ziklag only to find out that the enemy had snuck in while they were gone, had stolen away their families, their wives, their children, had burned everything to the ground. Right, And then it says that all of David's men thought of stoning him. They all wanted to kill David, right? Now David, I mean, in facing such disappointment, and he could have sunk into dismay, he could have become discouraged, but instead what did he do? He made a choice. A choice to encourage himself in the Lord. What does that mean? That means that I am going to choose how I react. You all know the the, the saying, right? You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you react, right? David chose to encourage himself. I can imagine him preaching to himself. I can imagine him reminding himself, God is in control of your life. You are not a victim of any any man's plans or any circumstance happening to you. God is in control. God is sovereign over your life. 
He holds you in the palm of his hand, and he's the one who causes all things to work together for the good of his purposes. Amen? Sometimes you got to preach to yourself, yes? Sometimes you got to prophesy to yourself. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself in the Lord, because nobody from the encouragement committee is going to call you today. <laughs> right? It's a choice. It's a choice, okay? And there's a second truth here that we learn from Peter is that discouragement comes at times when it's least expected. Discouragement is unexpected. And in fact, discouragement can even come after great victories. Jesus rises from the dead, appears to Peter, and he's ready to go back fishing. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong with fishing to all of our fishermen, except if Jesus calls you out of fishing and you want to go back to it. Anytime you go back to something that God called you out of, you're going in the wrong direction, right? Hello, right? So Peter here, he's ready to quit. He's ready to go, he's ready to go back to his, to his fishing boat, to his old life, right? And if it can happen to Peter and happen to the disciples, it can happen to you and me. It can happen to all of us. Discouragement can come at unexpected times. I mean, you can come to a powerful, anointed Sunday morning at the mission church, right, with the anointing of God, the presence of God, fellowshipping with the saints, talking with people, getting encouraged. Somebody prays for you. Somebody prophesies to you. I mean, you get awesome anointed bagels from the cafe. I mean, there's no better bagels in Hudson Valley than right here in the mission church, right? I mean, you come, you get all excited, you get all anointed, the Lord touches you, right? You can experience all of that, and then Monday morning comes. And when you wake up, before you even swing out of bed and put your feet on the ground, you're feeling all defeated and depressed and asking yourself, am I even saved? Come on, I know some of us have been there. Right? We've been there. We've had these incredible highs, and then all of a sudden, we're on this horrible, horrible low. Listen, discouragement is the number one way that the enemy shuts down our victories and our praise. This is why the enemy, I believe this is why the enemy tries to lure us and tempt us into sin. Not just to get us to sin, because the enemy knows that we can be forgiven, for, for sin. He wants to bury us in discouragement over our sin, just like Peter. He wants to bring us into such a place of condemnation and shame and, and, and guilt, right, that, that we just can't, we can't bear to go back to the Lord. And he wants to heap that condemnation on us again and again. So the enemy will come in those times when you had highest victories in praise and he will try to bring temptation. He'll try to lure you into a place where you feel condemned and guilty. But I want us to remember that no matter how far we may stray from the Lord in our conduct or in our attitudes, that the Lord is always ready to forgive. Come on, somebody needs to hear this word today. The Lord is always ready to forgive. Remember in Mark chapter 16, after that tomb was empty and the angel was there at the tomb and said to the women, he said, now go your way. He said, and I, he said, I want you to go and, and tell the disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead. And look what he says here, Mark 16, 7, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter. That's what he says. Tell his disciples and Peter, that he goes before you into Galilee, and there you'll see him as he said to you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. See, Jesus, the, the angels, they knew that, that, that Peter was just going to be, he was weeping bitterly over what he had done. That there was that shame, that guilt, that condemnation. But the angel said, you need to get word to Peter that hope is still alive. Hallelujah. Amen. That Jesus is still alive right? That even though you may have betrayed Jesus, your betrayal is not stronger than his power to resurrect. Amen. And he's still there. He's still available. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Discouragement is unexpected. Another truth about discouragement that we see from the disciples, discouragement is infectious. You can spread your discouragement to others. When Peter said, I'm going fishing, that impulse that emotion, that feeling spread to the other disciples. Well, we're going to go with you. This is especially true if you're a leader 
The enemy loves to attack leaders. This is why he always goes after leaders, because he knows that if he can, if he can discourage leaders, he's going to bring leaders into a place, people of influence into a place of hopelessness and bad attitude and miserable outlook, that their attitude is contagious, right? That when they're negative and that when they complain, right, and when they're talking, they're talking trash about other people, right, that attitude is contagious to other people. Amen. Amen. Fourth truth is, is kind of the same. If discouragement is infectious, it's also contagious. What, what's the difference? Well, contagious means that you can catch it from other people. Right? So you can be the one giving, but you can also be the one who's receiving from other people. The disciples were infected. We are going, we're going with you. They allowed themselves to be poisoned by the discouragement that Peter was carrying on himself and they got into Peter's boat, right? Be careful when you're around people who are always discouraged and disappointed and disillusioned, people who want to complain, people who want to talk negative because their attitude is contagious. Listen, this is, this is the default to our human nature. Our default is not to be positive. Our default is not to be optimistic and hopeful. Our default is to be negative and to complain. Have you ever noticed that? Amen, right? Hope is a discipline. Joy is a discipline. It doesn't come naturally. It's something that we have to remind ourselves to do, okay? And when we get around other people that are complaining and that are negative and that are discouraged, it's easy for us to get pulled into their boat. Be careful you don't jump into the wrong boat because discouraged people will always want you to ride along in their boat with them. Because if they can get you in their boat, then you being with them affirms their discouragement. It validates their discouragement. It tells them that they have a right to be discouraged, right? And I want you to know something. When you get into a boat with other people who are discouraged, Jesus isn't in that boat. Amen? I don't care who's in that boat. If Jesus isn't in the boat, I don't want to be in that boat. I don't care if the pastor's in the boat. I don't care if there are a bunch of deacons in the boat. I don't care who's, I don't care if the, the, mo, the pop, most popular person at the office is in the boat. If Jesus isn't in the boat, I don't want to be in that boat. And how do you know Jesus isn't in the boat? Because you're going to hear gossip in the boat. You're going to hear slander in the boat, right? You're going to hear complaining in the boat. And Jesus doesn't get in that boat. And if you're in somebody's boat of discouragement and all you hear is negative and people talking trash, you need to jump ship as soon as you can. Amen? You need to get out of the boat. Tell somebody, get out of the boat. Amen, right? So just a few points there that we learned about discouragement. Now, how does Jesus bring us out of discouragement. Thank God Jesus didn't leave the disciples, you know, floating around in the lake somewhere, right, all by themselves. Let's look at the rest of the story, verse 4. But when the morning had come now, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. A couple of points here I want to make. First of all, Jesus wants to teach us how to recognize him even when we can't see him. Now, look at verse 4. It says, He waited until morning, and then he stood on the shore. Notice, Jesus did not come immediately when they said they were going fishing. He didn't just immediately just walk up to them and just kind of materialize there and say, wait a minute, guys. No, don't, don't do that. I'm still alive. I still have plans for you, right? I'm going to send you out into this world. He let them sit out there all night in the boat catching nothing. And when he did appear, he didn't come to them walking on the water. How many remember Jesus is, is, has, known to, has been known to do that, Right? He didn't come walking on the water, and he didn't appear. He didn't just materialize in their boat like he did in that room. He appeared on the shore at a distance, hardly recognizable. What's that about? Well, let me explain it like this. For three years, following Jesus for the disciples was easy. Every day they saw him. 
They heard him. They touched him. Every day they were in his presence. I mean, up to that point, following Christ was all about seeing miracles, prayers being answered, getting, you. I mean, if they got hungry, there were the fish and the loaves. If they needed to pay taxes, just go grab a fish, open its mouth, there'll be a coin for you to pay your taxes. I mean, if your Peter's mother-in-law had a fever, Jesus touched her and healed her. I mean, they were just in the presence of Jesus, constantly seeing Jesus move. It was like for three years, they were walking walking by sight and not by faith. But now things were about to change in the disciples' lives. Jesus was resurrected and Jesus was going to ascend to the right hand of the Father. Jesus was not going to be with them physically anymore. Now they would receive the Holy Spirit, okay? But Jesus physically, visibly, would not be with them. And these guys as we all know, we're about to go through some pretty hard situations in the years to come, right? They would face a lot of resistance from the Jewish leaders. They would be persecuted. They would be imprisoned. And all of them, all of them except for one, John the Apostle, all of them would die horribly for their faith. And they needed to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. They needed to learn how to not be easily discouraged when they couldn't recognize, they couldn't see Jesus is with them. Understand what I'm saying. There would be times when it would be hard for them to see Jesus, and that's when they needed to have faith. Here's the point. Much of our disappointment and our discouragement comes from our inability to recognize Him. Right? So we, because we can't recognize God in our situation, we, we lose our focus from Him, we can't see Him, and our eyes start to focus on something else. And God wants us in a place where we can walk by faith, not by sight. Right? Where we may not feel His presence, but we know He's there. We may not see that He's moving, but we know that He is. We may not have any evidence of His hand in the circumstance, but we're, we can believe that He is working all things together for the good. That even though we can't see Him, we can recognize that God is with me. Right? This was the beginning of this, of this lesson for the disciples to understand. You need to be able to know, even though it feels like Jesus is, on, is distant and on the shoreline, he's still there. He's still with you. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. Amen? And then he says, verse 5, he says, he says, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. Now, whenever Jesus, you know, whenever Jesus asks a question, it's not because he's lacking information, right? And he needs you to fill in the gaps for him. Okay, whenever Jesus is asking a question, he's trying to draw your attention to something. Okay, right? He says, so guys, you made your choices. You're all going fishing, huh? You're going back to do your thing. You all want to be, go- be fishermen again, huh? So how's that working for you? You all decided you're just going to give in to your discouragement, go back to that old life? Yeah. So how's the fish? How's the taste? Got any food? All right. And he wanted to bring them to a point of realization that the choices that they were making were not the right choices. Sometimes we get discouraged. We find ourselves in a place of discouragement in our lives because of our own choices. So he needs us to face some hard realities, some realizations. That your disappointments, your discouragements can often be the consequences of your own choices. Because you've gotten into the wrong boat with the wrong people with the wrong attitude. And there's something that you need to do to correct where you're at. He says in verse 6, he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Okay, Jesus told them, Cast the net. He was saying there is something that you need to do in your life. And it starts with obeying me. Amen. Right? Cast your net. You've been out all night fishing. Cast it one more time on the right side of the boat. Right? Obey me. Follow me. Remember my words and do my words. Right? Part of overcoming our discouragement is asking, what is it, God, that I need to do in this situation? 
Sometimes we are praying or we're asking God to do something for us, and instead of Him doing it, He shows us what we need to do or stop doing that thing, whatever it is, that put us there in the first place. How many are tracking with me? Okay? We need to start doing something we haven't been doing. We need to stop doing something that we've been doing that put us in that difficult place in the first. In other words, make some good choices now that will undo the bad choices that you've made in the past. Can I say that again? Make some good choices now based on my commands, Jesus, based on my words, Jesus is saying, that will undo the bad choices that you've made in the past. There are some things that we may need to change to stop doing and to start doing that will keep us healthy, that will keep us in tune with the Holy Spirit and keep us victorious over the enemy. Now listen, I'm not talking about works of the flesh where our salvation is dependent on our works. I'm talking about the works of God, the commands of God revealed to us in Scripture that work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit in our lives in the process of making us more like Christ. It's knowing what is God saying to me about my life that I need to do, right? If you're praying for healing, you want God to do a miraculous healing in your life, but God shows you, you know what? The problem isn't that you need a healing. The problem is that you need to quit smoking. Hello? Hello? I know some of you are thinking, yeah, tell those smokers. Well, maybe it's not smoking. Maybe you need to start exercising. Ooh. Ooh. (laughs) Wasn't expecting that one, PG. Maybe you need to start eating right. All right, now you're just getting a little little too far with this stuff. (laughs) Maybe you're praying for... God to free you from anxiety and stress and and to give you you peace. And God starts to show you some of the anger and some of the control issues and some of the resentment that you have towards the people in your life that you need to start forgiving. Maybe you're praying against loneliness in your life and God starts to show you you need to start changing an attitude that's driving people away. Maybe you're praying for your marriage God shows you things that you need to change in the way that you speak to your husband or things that you need to change in the way that you speak to your wife. Hello? Amen? Right? What are some of those things that we need to do to undo choices, good choices we need to make based on God's Word that will undo some of the bad choices that got us to where we are in the first place? Amen. Now, I don't know what you may need to do in your lifetime to, in your life to overcome, but this is why we need to be in His Word. I cannot stress this enough. You need more than what you can get in a sermon. You need to be in the Word of God every day. Hallelujah. Because listen, you may not be able to see Jesus with your physical eyes. He may feel distant from you, but as long as you have His Word open and before you, God is speaking into your life. Amen? Right? And you need to be able to hear Jesus when he says to you, cast the net on the right side of the boat. Some of us aren't hearing cast the net on the right side of the boat because we're not in a place where we're hearing his word. And you're thinking if you can just come to church and hear a sermon, then God's going to give you what you need for the week. It doesn't work that way. Okay? All right? This is, all you're getting today is just like, it's just an add-on. All right? It's just like, like you need to be feeding yourself the Word of God, every day. Can you say every day? Right? And as you're in the Word every day, you're going to get the Word from the Lord. Cast the net on the right side of the boat. Amen. Right? Need to hear His Word. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. John 21, verse 7. I love this about John. It says, That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So that's John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John always liked to say that about himself. The disciple, you know, that he's writing about himself right there, right? I like too when it talks about how him and Peter raced to the tomb, right? And then and then the other disciple who outran Peter, he's talking about himself. (laughs) But I love this because John was the only guy in the boat who recognized Jesus on the shore. Amen. 
Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Now, it's, it's good to, listen, it's good to have people in your life who can remind you to keep your focus on Jesus. Isn't that good? Amen? But I don't want to be dependent on other people for that. I want to be able to recognize Jesus on my own. I want to be the John in my boat. Yes? Now, thank God there are times when I need people to come alongside me and say, you know, Greg, you need to remember, keep your eyes on the Lord, right? Amen. But we need to all get to that place where we can recognize Jesus and we're not dependent on other people. Verse, verse 7, when, Pete, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Doesn't make sense to me. I think if you're jumping into the sea, you're going to take garments off. But anyway, that's Peter. The other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. All right, final truth here. I'm just, I'm bringing this to a close. If you're disappointed, if you're discouraged, you need to come to Jesus. Just like Peter, immediately come to Jesus. Whatever you got, you need to just jump out of that boat. You need to come to Jesus. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you've caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. You know, the thing about Peter, Peter was a strong guy. Anybody ever hear of St. Peter's fish? Tilapia, right? The fish in that, in that area that could be as much as like two, three pounds like that. It says there are 153, very specific, very large fish. Peter goes, he grabs this net full of fish, right? All of this fish, plus the wet net, and whatever paraphernalia is there, and he drags it by himself, okay? Peter was a pretty strong dude. Yeah? Amen? Amen. I wouldn't have done that. I'd have let Pastor... I said, Dylan, go get the fish. <laughs> 153. And although there were many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. All right. Last point I want to make, we're going to close. Bring the fish. What does that mean? Jesus said, bring the fish. When you're on that boat and you throw that net where Jesus tells you to throw that net, it's going to produce some things in your life. You're going to learn some things. The fish represents what they acquired, what they got in that boat when they finally obeyed Jesus. The greatest lessons that we will learn about life are the lessons that we learn from overcoming discouragement. When things are going well, everything's working out in your life, you're not really growing. You're not really getting stronger. But when you're in a struggle, and when you're discouraged, and when you're in that boat, and you're about to lose your hope, and yet you push through, and you pray through, and you stay firm, and you keep praising, and you keep worshiping, and you keep showing up, and you keep serving, and you keep fighting the fight, and you keep confessing your joy and your hope, that's when you grow. That's when you get strong. That's when you get smart, and you learn the best lessons of life. I want you to know something, that disappointment can be a gift. Hello? When, when, you, when it, answered prayer comes, that's not when we learn. It's when the answers to our prayers don't come. That's when we have a chance to grow. Faith is not what happens when you get what you want. Faith is what happens when you don't get what you want, but you keep showing up, staying faithful, and praying through. Right? Disappointment is a gift. Right? So Jesus says, bring the fish. What does it mean? It means all that stuff that you've learned while you were in that boat, those lessons, bring it with you. Because the things that you've learned in that, in that boat, in your time of disappointment, they're going to feed you as you journey toward the upper room. Tell somebody, bring the fish. Bring the fish. Disappointments are a gift. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord God, for 
The disappointments that come, Lord, we recognize that they're a gift. They're an opportunity, Lord, for us to refuse discouragement and to instead choose joy. Choose peace of mind. I pray, Lord God, that you'll help us. But Lord, I know that there are some that struggle with discouragement even here circumstances, Lord, that come into their life, I pray, God, that this word will help them to remember that you will never leave them nor forsake them, that even if you're distant on the shore and hard to see, that, Lord, we can recognize that you're with us. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift a hand to the Lord. Come on, just take a moment. Just lift a hand to the Lord. Just say, Lord, help me in those times of disappointment. I'm disappointed at work. I'm disappointed at home. Disappointed in my marriage. Disappointed in my church. Thank you, Lord, for those moments of disappointment. Where instead of discouragement, I can choose joy. Instead of discouragement, I can choose faith. Instead of discouragement, I can choose praise. I can open up your word and get a word in season from you for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning into our service today. We're so thankful that you were able to join us. We pray that you're able to join us in person here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and 1045 every Sunday. We also have amazing children's programs here in the building on Sunday mornings for both services, as well Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock here in the building. We've got amazing children's programs. And then Friday nights from 7 to 9 o'clock, we have our youth programs. If you want to keep up to date with everything going on, please check out our social medias, as well as follow everything on our website at missionchurch.com. God bless you, and we'll see you around.